All right. Well, three o'clock. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Eric Welsh, and uh, I'm with Octavo Systems, and my co-presenter is uh, Jason Kreidner from BeagleBoard.org and Texas Instruments. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about system and package technology, uh, making it easier to build your own Linux computer. Uh, I really would enjoy for this session to be interactive, so please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Uh, we'll be talking about a lot of hardware stuff, uh, so I know that is not necessarily everyone's forte. So if, you, if there's anything that, that you want to touch on from a, a heart, uh, get into some more depth or anything like that, please uh, let us know. And we have a microphone around there so that everyone can hear the questions and everything. Um, and if you want, uh, after the presentation, feel free to come up and talk to us about any other questions you might have. All right, so starting off, we have this single board computer revolution. There's a proliferation of prototyping boards. I mean, we have Raspberry Pi, Beagle Bones, basically anything you ever want to do, you can prototype now that you, you just 10 years ago, five years ago, you weren't able to do. There's all sorts of these new prototyping boards that are out there. Uh, you have incredible development communities that are supporting new users, and, and you, you have this huge collaboration uh, amongst people coming up from school or just getting started with projects, deciding that, hey, I need to, I need to redo my, my system, and so now I have a platform that I can, I can use in order to do that. Uh, there's a huge exposure to Linux on all of these new single board computers. So, I mean, you, you have known proven Linux solutions, and from all this, you, you're able to prototype your systems much more uh, quickly, much more efficiently, much more effectively than you ever have been. And so that's, that's the framework that we live in today. Now, as, as a software person, you need to be involved in the hardware development decisions. Because if the hardware guy comes to you and says, hey, there's this really cool piece of uh, component that you've got to use, but there's no drivers for it. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a non-starter. I mean, it's, it, or unless it, the hardware has to be really good for you to have to, to invest the time and energy to go write actual drivers for it. Because that, that's software and, I mean, as, as you're trying to drive your component or you get your product to market as quickly as possible, that's, that's a, gonna be a long pole, trying to write a new driver for a new piece of hardware. So as a, as a software developer, you need to be intimately involved in these hardware decisions. I mean, there are a lot of platforms. We, we talked about all the single board computers. They are, are great starting points for your software development so that you can focus on the value add for your product. You don't want to have to rewrite drivers because that really doesn't add a lot of value to your product. Integrating new f features and, and making sure that you're able to, to focus your software energy on the things that add value. Now, similarly, as a software developer, you want to make your hardware guy's life as easy as possible. So as you come to the, the, the table and say, OK, what do I need it to, in, from uh, the hardware guys in order to make sure that, that I can prototype this and get my, focus on my value add from a software point of view, you also need to be considerate of the hardware guys to use open hardware platforms so that the hardware guys can focus on the value add as well. They don't need to, to be able to, I mean, if you start with a closed source platform like Raspberry Pi or something, it, it becomes very difficult for you to go design your hardware system around that because I can't buy chips from DigiKey. I can't go and, and get uh, all my components and uh, uh, sourcing everything is difficult, just going in and rede redesigning the hardware. Now I'm, I'm stuck, I have to integrate a known module as opposed to uh, being able to, to necessarily get the form factor that I want for my product. Uh, so similarly, from a software, you, you want to focus on your, your value add from a software point of view. You also need to be considerate of the hardware and make sure that they focus on the value add for the hardware, not rerouting DDR. Because, I mean, having DDR doesn't, isn't a bullet point on your, on your product. It, DDR has to work. You have to have memory. Memory has to, has to be functioning but it's not going to add value to your product, and that can cause a lot of headaches in your product lifecycle development. So 
there's this whole gap between prototype and product. So when you're developing a custom PCB, you have to, you have to try to focus on your form factor. You want smaller, you want, but, but as at the same time, you have to understand that as you're driving down size and everything, it's harder to do. And so you, you, want, you want your open hardware so that you have known good solutions. Uh, similarly, you want to make sure that you have known good software solutions. So you want to make sure as you're going from this prototyping platform. So there's this myriad of, of prototyping platforms out there. You need to be cognizant of what those prototyping platforms offer in terms of transition from the prototyped to the product. Because if you don't start with a good prototyping solution, then it's going to be very difficult to make that transition. You're going to have a lot harder time, spend a lot more energy getting from that prototype to your product than you would otherwise. And like everything else today, you have to do more with less. And so that's, that makes it even more critical that you have to choose plat starting plat prototyping platforms with the goal of migrating to an end product in mind. So what are some of the things that can simplify your life? Well, system and package can really provide a simple Linux hardware solution. So what are the minimum things when using a, a system and package device, what are the minimum things required to run Linux? Well, you need to connect up your power. You need to connect a clock. You have some boot mode registers to select what you boot from. And then you need a boot media. So you need your Linux image. And from that, now you have a completely running Linux hardware system. So if you wanted to, the, this, the, this is the, the Pocket Beagle, uh, one of the new development boards from beagleboard.org. And as you can see, there's very little on this particular board. I mean, it is, it is very tiny and single-sided, and it allows you to run Linux on, on it. And it was actually very easy to develop. And so one of, the, one of the cool things about the fact that the system and package is incorporating a lot of the complexity from a hardware perspective is that if you wanted to, you could almost debug this with about 30 connections. So you need like 16 connections for your boot mode selection. You need two for your clock. You need a couple for your boot media. And then you need a handful of other uh, power connections in order to make sure that you can choose the right I.O. voltages. You can hook up uh, some of the power management IC signals to the processor uh, that were done uh, from a flexibility point of view. But so in like 30 soldering connections, you could take this and debug it and have a Linux computer that can run. So that's the kind of simplification you want to look for from a hardware point of view. Now you're your hardware guy's life is way easier. They get to focus on the value add of, of what they're trying to do. So they get to focus on adding the, the components that are gonna make your hardware differentiated as opposed to having to focus on all of this, this uh, extra stuff that is just complexity in this day and age. So we all can remember back when from, from college, we, we did a microcontroller system. It's pretty simple. I mean, it has a, a tiny, I mean, your, your microcontroller, very self-contained. You worried about what you wanted to hook up to it. Um, the microcontroller, you, you hook it up over JTAG, you ran some code, very easy. But as we move to a typical microprocessor, suddenly there's a whole realm of complexity that comes in. And mainly because the fact that we need a lot faster memory. We need a lot more memory in order to run uh, today's Linux systems. And so now, instead of having this nice, integrated, compact microcontroller that is easy to program, now we have to worry about DDR. And I, I don't know if you've ever talked with any, any hardware guys that have tried to route DDR. It is not a very fun endeavor. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you have to do in order to get it right, and if you get it wrong, it's a very long debug cycle, and, and you have to keep iterating on it, and it can just destroy schedules and cause a lot of, of pain uh, as, as you go forward. So the fact that you have, you have to have DDR in today's systems is, is just that. That's it's what it is. And so if you can look at trying to find a solution that allows your hardware guys to not have to deal with that, a huge advantage. Uh, similarly, 
there's a lot of different power rails that have to happen in today's more complex power uh, processors. So not only do you have your I.O. voltages, but you have all these core voltages. You want to get, have these low power systems, so you have a bunch of different voltage rails for different parts of your processor. And so those things are, are contributing to the complexity that you would otherwise have not had to deal with in your microcontroller system. So the, the, the answer, or at least our answer, is a system and package. So what does that do? Well, it integrates uh, a processor, uh, some power management, some uh, DDR, uh, an LDO, and all the associated passives into a single piece, of, uh, a single substrate, single package device. So now you get a single BGA as opposed to having to deal with all of these other separate components and deal with that complexity. Now, most people are scared by the term BGA. These aren't your typical BGAs. Uh, the pitch on these is uh, 1.27 millimeters, so 50 mil, which is huge. So most of, you, when, when people get scared of BGAs, they're talking about 0 0.4, 0 0.3 millimeter pitch, and, and those, are, those are hard to deal with. But when you're talking about these, these wide pitch BGAs that, that, I mean, one comment from, from one of our users was you could drive a truck through the balls because they're so big, so wide. And, and so that's, that's where uh, it, it really, um, it helps simplify the system, but it also allows you to do a, a lot in terms of, of make it easy to, to design with from a hardware perspective. So how do we construct a system and package? Well, first, uh, you actually have silicon wafers. Uh, you actually go through and you probe silicon wafers. Uh, you make sure that you have known good dye from your silicon wafer. You chop up the wafer, and then you actually go and attach it uh, using wire bonders in order to uh, put it down on, on your substrate. Uh, you also have discrete components. So you have packaged parts that you might want to use. Uh, you have passives. Now, some of the reasons you might want to actually use pass, uh, packaged parts, uh, so for DDR3, uh, JDEC actually uh, specified at the package level what the standard was. And so you have a standard pinout for a DDR3 memory, but at the package level. Now, in newer standards, they actually start specifying stuff at the die level. But at that point in time, JDEC didn't specify anything about the die. And so if you want to actually be able to switch between different memory vendors or things like that, so sourcing issues that you might encounter, uh, you have to actually go use just packaged memory. And so the, you'll find that um, in the, the OSD system and package device that we use on the Pocket Beagle, it actually does use a package DDR primarily for that particular reason. Now then that attached die and those discrete component, components are all put on a substrate. Now a substrate is basically a small printed circuit board. It's, it's, it just allows you to, to have much tighter routing rules and much tighter design constraints than most standard printed circuit boards. Uh, it's still FR4, it's still a, a pretty much a, a normal, uh, normal circuit board, but now instead of uh, like using four or, or five mil traces, you're able to use uh, 40 micron trace width and 50 micron space rules. And so there, you're down in the, the one mil, one and a half mil type uh, routing rules. And so you're, you have a lot more, you can do a lot, uh, things a lot denser. Uh, and allows you to, to keep your components a lot closer and, and pack them all together, especially because now you're using bare die, you don't have to worry about the, the, the additional space that you needed in order to expose all of the different pins. Because a lot of, a lot of the, the space that, that uh, a, a particular component takes up is how many pins does it need. And so the, the size of a given device tends to depend on the number of pins that you have. And and so by, by using bare die, you're able to hook things together and crush and, and get them a lot closer than you would on a standard printer circuit board because you don't have to worry about uh, getting it out to pins. You can actually use uh, stuff like wire bonds in order to make your connections down from the die to the substrate. And, and last but not least, you have the pins on the back. And so like we said, uh, there's the wide pitch BGA. Uh, it, it, we actually have had uh, 
some, uh, one, one of our, our users uh, hand solder one of these onto a board, and we'll actually uh, show, show the, the little bit of the video on that in a couple minutes. So the question that, that comes to mind, though, is, is why can't you just use an SOC? I mean, SOC has been the way that we've, we've allowed, us, allowed systems to grow smaller and smaller for the last couple years. I mean, last 10 years, it's, it's, we used to have a processor only, and now we have a processor, co -processor, graphics coprocessor, all sorts of peripherals, all in the same piece of silicon. So why can't we just accomplish this whole goal with an SOC? Well, primarily, we are a victim of our own success in that Moore's law has driven us into a lot of different ways. So for processors and memory, we've, we've, Moore's law has driven us into a very low voltage, uh, low power dissipation vector from a, a process point of view. So in a silicon process, we've, we've, we've looked at, at optimizing our processes so much, and so we can do great things from a, a memory and a processor point of view. But from an RF point of view, if we wanted to look at optimizing that, well now we need to, to have a high power dissipation, high clock frequency, but low voltage. And so there have been processes that have been optimized for, for particular RF uh, circuits that are kind of disparate from what you get for what, what the best processes are for memory and processors. Uh, similarly, you, you see the same kind of thing with power. Um, it, it's a different set of optimizations on silicon process that have made power circuitry so good. And, and, and last but not least, you have, you have sensors and, and analog. And all of these things are kind of pulling pulling it apart from a silicon process point of view. You're trying to, op in order to get the best uh, performance of each of these areas, you have to tune your process. And, and so when you go and reach for an SOC, an SOC basically can only pick one silicon process to do everything in. And that causes, it, causes you to compromise. You basically, you have to compromise on everything in order to pick one process that'll allow you to do an SOC. Now, that's, that can be okay, and that's, that's, that allows you to do a lot of things, but what's nice about the, the fa that kind of idea of system and package is that we don't have to do the compromise. We can take die that have been optimized for each of the given processes and now combine those all together on a substrate. So now we kind of get the best of all worlds as opposed to having to, to compromise in all areas. So that's, that's in general why we, we look at system and package as kind of this next level of integration as opposed to just using a, another system on chip or integrating more into a system on chip. So with the OSD3358, the, the impetus was to look at uh, the major components of a single board computer. So we, we look, took, uh, worked with Jason a lot on the BeagleBone Black, and we identified what were the core components that made that, that, uh, that were difficult to deal with. So the DDR, the power management, um, just uh, all, all the different uh, capacitives that added a lot of, of assembly cost. Uh, so, I mean, the fact that you can integrate 100 passives and don't have to put 100 passives down on a PCB will lower the cost of your product because it's just easier for assemblers to deal with. They, you, I mean, if, if it ta takes half a cent to place each component, now you place one component instead of 100, you've saved quite a bit of money from an assembly point of view. And so we, we looked at all of these different types of components and pulled them all together into a single package that you could deal with easily. Um, so taking a little bit of a dive into what does this look like from a, a more, some more detail, um, it's actually uh, the, 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 SIP, the system and package uses a six layer substrate. So basically you get a second six layer board inside the little BGA component so that, that allow, that's where you're dealing with all this routing, all this complexity, is because you actually have another six layer board sitting there on top of your printed circuit board. So by dealing with the complexity there, you're able to do a lot more in your circuit board on a lot fewer layers. And we'll talk about that in a, in a couple minutes. But then uh, there's all sorts of cool stuff because once you overmold it, um, you can see from some of these, uh, the, the, some of the 
uh, SEM pictures uh, that you're able to uh, see. So here are the wire bonds uh, in here. You can see some of the trace routing uh, as part of the cross-sectional cut down here. Um, and you can see these little dots here are where they cut the, the wire bonds as they cut through the, 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 um, the SIP. So like you can see the, the cut line was here, and so you can see some of the cuts uh, along that. Uh, you can see uh, some of the dye that's inside the package DDR. Uh, you can actually see uh, what the mold compound looks like zoomed in uh, tremendously. And so this is actually uh, where it's bonded a wire bond dye down onto a package. So like one of these little wire bonds here blowing up, uh, that's, that's what it looks like. And then all of the circles are part of the, old, the mold compound that's around it. Um, all right, so let me do show uh, a quick, a quick video. Um, this I thought thought this would be interesting. So this is what it looks like uh, when the wire bonder is actually going and bonding all the wires down uh, for for one of the the die. So basically, uh, the wire the there's a gold filament that's coming down, and it's just like sewing. So the gold filament is is attached. Uh, is attaching onto the silicon die and then down onto the bond pads of the substrate. And so they have these crazy machines that will go through and, and go really quick and allow you to, to wire bond uh, to, to all these different things. And so that's basically where it, when it, when it attaches uh, your wire bonds here, it's a, a machine like that that's actually going through and doing it. And so there's all sorts of cool manufacturing stuff uh, associated, associated with this. Uh, and so uh, from that, now, now we are able to do these cool boards like our Pocket Beagle. And with that, I'm going to let Jason talk a little bit about Pocket Beagle. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm Jason Kreidner. I'm a 25-year employee of Texas Instruments and a founder of BeagleBoard.org, along with Gerald Coley, back 10 years ago. And um, when, when we were first doing BeagleBoard, one of the things that um, was actually a, a consideration um, was using um, system on module or SOM technology because you know, we, our goal always has been to create a real open hardware platform and try to simplify things so that people can make their own Linux computers. Um, but the, but the real economics of it didn't quite make sense. Um, you know, when you look at having to add a whole other PCB, it's a whole, it's a whole extra effort. You have to add connectors. Um, there's a whole lot of things that just um, you, you could you could you could funny money it, but you couldn't make it really lower the ultimate uh, manufacturing cost. Um, with the system and package approach, and it's one we'd encourage all um, you know silicon vendors and everybody to kind of to, to to evaluate. Um, we actually have the potential for reducing the real costs, not just the um, the funny money um, you know sales prices. Um, but the actual cost, because the, the assembly step is something that already has to be done, right? You still have to take the die and put them into a package. Um, so why just take one die um, and put it into a package when you can take the, the, all the dies and then create something that's actually much simpler? So it has a lot of the, the, those benefits out of system of module stuff that's been around um, for, for ages, um, but actually, you know, by, by using, you know, standard um, packaging, um, you know, we could just use it like a regular chip now. So, you know, like we're really, you know, we, we, we're not really close to that, that, that Linux on a chip. We've done it, right? It's done. Linux on a chip. Um, and I think that's a, a, a bit of a game changer. So um, part of the, it was part of the motivation for, for creating the, 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 the Pocket Beagle. Um, you know, but we also did it to, to, get something, to get something smaller, to get something lower cost. Um, to users and to really kind of deliver uh, more on that open hardware promise, right? We really want people to be able to uh, to take and modify our designs and grow our ecosystem in that way um, with a, a you know a, an eclectic mix of hardware um, rather than just everybody buying our boards, right? We think there's a lot more opportunity for innovation if people actually change things and build around it. I don't want to talk too too much more about the the SIP and processor details, but those are. Um, you know, some of, some of the high-level bullet points are there um, on the, the slide. Um, you know, it's a, it's a full Linux computer, and it's got some really cool features with the, um, some of the microcontrollers and all the analog stuff that's, um, that's a part of it. Um, you know, from a, um, 
um, a, a, you know, board design perspective, we we provided some hundred mil headers. We could have made this board smaller. Um, the, the the we did, we chose the a small mint tin as the the form factor because the the original beagle bone was also done in a mint tin form factor, just the bigger one. Because um, <laughs> in, in my mind, um, the, you know, the, the tools for computing are fundamental survival tools, right? This is technology we need to make sure the future understand, that the, the, the future generations understand um, that they're gonna build on. And so it's a fundamental tool for survival and I just really love the meme of people putting survival kits in mint tins. So this is your survival kit, right? But now we've gone from the big mint tin um, to the little mint tin um, for, for, um, for our survival tool. And there's, but, but that's still, even at the 100 mils, we can, we, you know, we can give you nice big fat um, pins, we didn't put anything on the bottom side of the board. If you want to, you can use this board like a SOM. Um, you can drop this right onto your design. You can um, essentially use um, a reflow oven um, to solder it down through those pins. Um, that's one of the reasons we didn't put headers on it, right? So you can actually choose how you want to interconnect. Um, you know, in the future, there might be a version with headers, uh, whatever, don't wait. Uh, <laughs> go get one. Um, but that's the, that's the basic idea. There's a lot of flexibility um, in this in this computer, um, so it's 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 it, it features our um, you know uh, the cool SIP um, from our from our from our, our you know, hardware supplier partner here, um, but it's um it's it's got a whole bunch on it. Um, on that um, that far side, uh, there's some of the the different MUX modes. Um, out of those headers, you can do, you, there's, think, there's analog to digital converters, there's quadrature encoder inputs, there's um, spy ports, UART ports, um, and everything, and all the, the there's, every, every different digital pin has eight different MUX modes where you can kind of configure what's out there. Um, and we've got some, um, we, 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 the layout is done also so that we can connect to the, the microelectronica uh, microbus click boards. Um, so you can actually connect two of those based on where it's pin out, and that's over 400 different out on boards that you can use today, um, you know, with some with some s small software help from you guys. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, but but they're they're hardware compatible, um, and um, you know, so I think it you know being at 25 dollars and stuff, it gives you a lot of flexibility to go and create um, your own Linux computers, either starting with the Pocket Beagle or then eventually building your own design. Uh, this is to give you an example of, of, of what's in there. It's a little bit of an eye chart, but honestly, for the entire schematic of the board of a Linux computer, <laughs> right, this is not too bad. Most of the space is actually taken up by the net names, right? So if you see, um, you know, down uh, the, like that, the, the far, um, the far left, or far right side, <laughs> um, you'll see all the stuff breaking out of the, the SIP. Most of that's um, just so that it can go to the one sheet down um, where all the headers are, and that's where that's where most of the um, the, the board stuff is. Um, you talked about um, the different those those thirty types of connections, whatever. Those most that's all in that first this this top the the top left, um, so that you can change what the I/O voltages are. You actually connect them up manually on the board, but there's not too many of those. Um, gets you that all you need is that the the crystal. Like so, you need a clock source. You need power. Um, for boot, um, you see the, the micro SD. Um, you could also boot off the USB or the serial, but um, you, typically people would boot off of the micro SD. Um, actually, it's kind of nice if you want to stay, for, if you want to go to my net console talk, I'll show you just doing everything um, on USB, actually booting it up and running from, from USB. So the only thing you would need um, is the, 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 the bottom left side to tilt at the boot modes, and then the power and the USB is the boot source as well. Um, so it's, it, it gets pretty simple um, in terms of, of you know, what a computer looks like. So hopefully that gives you an idea of that. Um, questions for me before I uh, turn it back over to Eric? Because Eric, Eric, I think, wants to show you the, the actual layout. assembly of the... the layout. And the, and the layout, right? So actually show what this, what this layout looks like. Uh, for for Beagle, um, not you know not the, the, the not for Octavo systems, uh, we have a multi-core A15 with the BeagleBoard X15 um, that's readily available today. Um, I know last DLC, every five minutes walking in the door, hey, where's the X15s? Why can't I get one? <laughs> um, you can get them now. We solved the the the, the um, uh, kind of all the the supply chain stuff around that, so they're now readily available. Um, 
So it's a, it's a more expensive board, and it's got a lot of other stuff in it. It's got really high-speed I.O. with PCI Express and USB 3 and, and, and craziness, but it is a multi-core, um, you know, in terms of, you know, when do we get it into the Beagle Bone or, or Pocket Beagle form factor? It's kind of just, it's a stay tuned, right? Um, but that's kind of our, our, our kind of our roadmap process, kind of start at the, the desktop replacement model and then move it into the more embedded um, systems as we kind of optimize the design. Um, any other questions for me before I turn it back to? Where's the M3? The, uh, it, so the M3 is actually on the SOC, so it's on the AM335X uh, die itself. Um, there's, I guess, technically f well, five exposed CPUs um, because there's the ARM Cortex A8, there's the two PRUs, there's the Cortex M3 that's typically used for power management. But you can use it for other stuff. It's just that most people use the PRUs to kind of add stuff because the PRUs have this ultra low latency I/O. Um, so when people start adding microcontroller code stuff to the to to the to the Beagles, they like to use the PRUs because um, like the, the, the M3s have like a four-stage pipeline, so you can't get the you can can't get anywhere close to the low latency to the I/O pins that you can get from the PRU. And lastly, and leastly, um, there's an XGS5, SGX530 graphics accelerator in there. Um, that's the only thing that has a closed blob on it. You don't need it for boot, unlike some other platforms. It boots, um, it boots clean straight into mainline uh, U-boot, so you don't have to deal any closed blobs for your, for your Linux systems, um, unless you want to use the, the user space um, 3D graphics control, then you need the SGX blob. What networking is available? So then the, the networking that comes like stock on this is just the USB networking, right, over the, the cable. You can, you can flip it over as host and use uh, and provide power. There's, there's little Y cables where you can provide power in and flip it over as host. So you can put up a USB Wi-Fi dongle, um, plug it in and power it over the same connector and use that as host. Um, you need to kind of log in first so, and configure it so that it, it, at, at next boot up, it, um, it uses that USB Wi-Fi. Um, but you can just use conman uh, config files to kind of set that up by default. Um, practically most people, like uh, for, for early development, a lot of what people do would take the click modules, there's a bunch of them, there's a click module for um, Ethernet. Um, so you add a device tree overlay um, in our, our boot config and uh, you can use the Ethernet adapter um, over SPI. Uh, there's also um, Wi-Fi, there's also the USB um, on the expansion headers, so there's USB on the expansion headers themselves. Uh, you can take like a little, Adafruit and SparkFun both make breakout boards that you can um, connect up and I made the, I organized the pins so that you can wire those pretty much up directly. Um, so if you want to put a USB host, but instead of just putting that, that type A connector on the board, I wanted to bring it across to the, the pin headers um, so that you could do that. Um, in a, in, a, in a myriad of ways, so if you want to put a hub on there. And there's a number of different add-on boards, including the bacon bits that we're using for the EL classes and some stuff on Tindy where you can get USB host ports that you can solder down onto it. Um, oh, and internet connection sharing is probably the most common, actually. So you turn on internet connection sharing on your host, um, you issue a DHCP um, on the, 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 the Beagle, and then it can get to the internet. So that's, that's the most common way to app, like app get packages on your, your board. But then to follow up, um, from, from a, a system and package processor point of view, it supports all the networking that the AM3358 supports. And so, uh, like, if you actually, if you use the Beagle on Black as a prototyping platform, Basically, you can, you can use the system and package device, even though the BeagleBone Black itself doesn't use the system and package device, because the BeagleBone Black uses all the same components as the system and package device, you can actually prototype your, your platform on the BeagleBone Black as well uh, and still get the same benefits because from a hardware point of view, you're now able to just kind of hook up to the same IOs that you would have otherwise. Uh, and, and so from a networking point of view, there are Ethernet uh, ports and, and things like that from a processor point of view so that you can actually get to it. And uh, if, if you're interested, there's uh, definitely a lot more information on our website, octavosystems.com. Um, so one of the things that, that's nice about the, the fact that you're integrating stuff inside the system and package is that um, you don't necessarily have to follow the pinout of the original device. 
Um, if we look at the AM3358, the, it's, it's a 384 ball BGA. Um, but if we look closely, we can see that power management takes up, uh, power management plus DDR take up over a hundred and some odd pins uh, out of out of that those 384. And so, if we actually look at just the I/O signals, uh, we actually realize that that if we it, because we can connect all these things internally, we can actually get down to a 256 ball BGA, and then we can optimize it. So we can optimize it such that all of the signal pins are in those outer three rows and columns, such that you could actually escape the whole BGA in one layer using six mil trace, six mil space routing rules. So very easy to manufacture, very standard routing rules. You're able to escape all of your signals in one layer. You can provide power on the power straps at the top, and then you have a ground ring, and the only things in the center uh, are your output power rails. So then, then some of the connections to, to set I.O. voltages and stuff like that. So you can use power pores uh, to set your I.O. voltages, but as long as you don't need any output power, you could potentially route the whole thing in one PCB layer, which is uh, uh, amazing from a cost savings point of view. So now instead of having to use a six layer board because I had to do DDR routing and stuff, now I can conceivably get away with just a one layer board. Um, now you, you will have to have some power and ground planes and stuff like that. Uh, and so generally we find that, that most customers do a four layer board because four layer boards nowadays are almost as cheap as two layer boards. But um, you, you find that, that it's, it's very easy to do all of, all of these types of, of routing escape uh, things just with a very few number of layers. Now because I don't have to deal with this complexity of DDR routing, of power management, uh, plane routing, I can do it in, in a lot fewer layers and I don't have to worry about as nearly as much complexity. So what that translated to, so the, the Pocket Beagle is, is a four layer PCB. Um, I mean, you were able to do it single-sided. You didn't have to put any capacitors on the back because all the capacitors needed for the processor are inside the system and package. So most boards, you have this whole array of processors right underneath it, or array, or array of capacitors right underneath the, your processor because you need the capacitance really close to the processor. Well, we've integrated all that inside the, the processor. So now in that system and package, you don't have to worry about placing all these caps right underneath your uh, underneath your main your main processor. It's all in there. That way, you can do a single-sided board, and it makes it easy to do all of these these uh, layout things in a very few number of layers using very standard manufacturing rules. So that's the whole six mil trace, six mil space. I mean that that is very cheap to manufacture. Uh, and similarly, from a via size, you're able to use large vias uh, that'll allow you to do very easy. Uh, hardware design. So, um, uh, and then, and then one of, one of the things I'll bring up here um, is uh, the so one of, one of the our our colleagues, uh, Michael Welling, um, he actually went through and did a hand assembly uh, of of basically one of these uh, using uh, using a stencil he got from Oshpark and, and uh, hand placement and hand routing. And so he actually went and did a, sh a short little video, we won't watch it all, um, about, about how to go through and, um, and do a lot of uh, basically get, getting, getting a, a stencil and then being able to go uh, squeegee on solder uh, to one of the, the boards, um, put it, putting it down, cleaning it off, um, and then uh, the, the fun part is you're able to go and uh, if you want to watch the whole video, you're, you're more than welcome to. It's on, uh, up on YouTube, um, but he, you can squeegee out your, your solder and, uh, and then from that you're able to now go and uh, do hand placement of all sorts of components. Um, so the, and the main part is because the BGA is such a wide pitch, it actually is pretty easy to hand place. So you can't do that with the 
four millimeter BG, <laughs> space, space BGAs, but because you're looking at a wide pitch BGA, you're actually able to go through and hand place this, and he actually got all, all five of them to work that he actually did as part of, part of this whole hand assembly process. And then he shoved it through his own uh, little toaster uh, oven that he built into a reflow oven. Uh, so, so you, you can you can you can go through and do this in the the comfort of your own house. <laughs> you just have to go go <laughs> go convert a couple of things. But so he was able to to go uh, get one of the early prototypes of uh, this. This was the the precursor to the Pocket Beagle. But he was able to go get everything um, uh, powered up and and. Uh, booted and everything like that. And so you're able to actually go through and do hand assembly of this. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's fun when you're able to do something like that. Um, and um, by, by using something like a system and package, you're actually able to, to go and, and do things like that because it, otherwise, I mean, with, with standard DDR packaging and some of the standard uh, processors, you're not able to do, do things like that. So it makes it really does make it simple in order to actually build your own computer. Now we talk about manufacturing, we talk about uh, some of the software stuff, but really a lot of it comes in. It's 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 really simplifies your board bring up process. Now instead of having to to go through and and worry about this this DDR not working, all you have to do you you verify your power rails, you verify your power isolation, and and so you you make sure that that you you get everything that, that you didn't short power and ground. And, and once you do that, once you verify that with your DMM, then you go download your latest image. Uh, you, might, you, will nest, you will need to uh, customize the device tree. Um, but then you power up the board, and you can start seeing, uh, seeing it boot. And so it, it becomes a very easy boot bring up process, as opposed to a lot of, of other things where you are, have to stress about, did I actually get all the power routing correctly? Correct. Uh, all, all of the different power rails, uh, are, are the planes good enough? Are they supplying power uh, effectively to the processor or to the DDR? Uh, did I actually length match all the different buses in DDR correctly in order for it to actually meet the 800 megahertz timing or the whatever timing you needed for the DDR? So th it, it really helps uh, simplify the, the whole of that design process. Uh, now I talked about. Throw, I'm gonna, oh. Sorry, I'm going to throw in on that one. Um, sure. So, so I've I've been um, I've helped a, a handful, uh, probably about 14 different boards at this point that that, that I've had, had some involvement in doing the the, the bring up with uh, the process. Um, the, the the process has been really really super simple. Um, like as in like doing board bring up, but then like getting into before doing anything else, we're actually into the kernel. Right, so before we try to worry about any of the other peripherals, the the display, the the, the all the other sensors and everything else, you're you're into the kernel um, rather than have to write your own tools to go and do that. Um, you you're you're just using standard like um, kernel tools for toggling GPIOs or talking to I squared C devices and exploring them or, or loading different things for SPI or doing the um, configuring the LCD bus, right? So um, much much tr easier than traditional board bring up. Um, and I'll I'll show um, it, it my, my my net console talk. I'll talk about just how to do that entirely just over USB to the point that you're in the Linux kernel with no other connections than, than USB, not even serial. Um, so it, this this is something where you know what would usually take you know like three days for an experienced um, embedded Linux engineer to kind of bring up the DDR, bring up everything else. Um, now is like in a couple hours, tops. Um, so it's, this is this is really nice. Yep. And and as we we talk about, you you will have to look at potentially modifying your device tree. So this is where you you do have to look at your customization, and as you would for any any system. So uh, from your prototype to your your production, you're always going to want to make sure that your device tree has been modified in order to to uh, make sure that it's optimized for your system. Uh, okay. Through. Throw one more in there. You don't need you, if it, if you're if you're basing it off of something like the Pocket Beagle that has so little on it, um, you can actually just bring it up on the Pocket Beagle first. Like we just you know to start with a really simple device tree and then start adding this stuff later. So yes, you do need to customize it, but you're already running Linux. You're already validating yes. hardware before you ever do any of that. Yep. 
and and so and then like like uh, Jason was saying, you can actually use device tree overlays in order to help uh, facilitate your adding of of uh, different device tree components uh, to your device tree. And so you can actually go through and and build everything out, uh, starting with the very simple device tree uh, that that's provided for you. And there's a lot of different examples. Uh, and we want to thank uh, Robert Nelson for all of the work that he has done in putting together all of this device tree stuff for us. And uh, so the, there's a link to the device tree rebuilder that he, he publishes uh, for that. So uh, kind of just recapping, um, basically using a system and package device for your Linux computer basically brings hundreds of components or 100 plus components into a single package. So it makes your board design faster, simpler, easier. It allows you to focus on both the software value add as well as the hardware value add, as opposed to worrying about these things that, that are, 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 can be challenging and, and time consuming and don't really uh, cause, add any differentiation or any value to your product. Uh, it ensures the fact that you're going to have an easier board bring up. You're going to be able to do all of this stuff without having to, to um, worry about these complex things failing. Um, it, it allows you to, to have uh, a lower cost PCB, easier to manufacture, um, lower cost manufacturing, um, and, and like we said, some people hand soldered this. So it, it really bridges that gap between prototype and production. So you have, you have your open hardware platforms, you have the open source software, and so it's easy for you to migrate from that prototype to your product. And so as you go forward, uh, try to make sure that as you're, you're considering different prototyping platforms, you think about that, that gap between getting from my prototype to my product and then making sure that, that, that you're doing that uh, with something in mind that allows both your hardware designer to enjoy life and make sure that everything's easy, as well as make your own life easier. And, and then as you, as you look at SIP technology in general, there's going to be a lot more coming out soon. I mean, Intel has announced uh, various system and package devices. Uh, other companies are, are looking at SIP technology as the way forward for the next level of integration. And so you're going to be seeing a lot more from system and package coming forward. And it's, it's going to help make both uh, our lives easier from a hardware perspective as well as from a software perspective. So with that, uh, we would like to thank you. And we're open for any questions. Uh, sure. Which one? Oh, we can, let, me, let me give you the mic. Whoa, whoa. Sure. How hard would it be to integrate, say, like a um, ATH10K for NICE and, but not do it through USB? Like, I have Wi-Fi, but I don't want to use USB. So Wi-Fi is always a tricky one. I mean, because uh, a lot of times when you're looking at a product, Wi-Fi needs to be placed in a particular uh, particular area of your board for FCC purposes and for various other things. So yes, you can integrate Wi-Fi, and I do believe that, that you will see more system and package devices integrating Wi-Fi, but there are some challenges about that because by putting Wi-Fi in there, it starts dictating where you might have to place the entire device. And, and it starts dictating a little bit more of your form factor. And so that's the, there, there's some, some challenges with that, but you will, you will definitely see Wi-Fi in being integrated more in system and package devices. Uh, temperature range. Temperature range. Um, so the, the, basically, your temperature range is whatever the components uh, that make up your system and package device. Uh, so uh, for, for uh, the OSD3358, uh, it's offered in both commercial and industrial temperature ranges, so 0 to 85C and minus 40 to 85C. Um, it, it, like I said, it, it depends on the components. So uh, depending on what type of DDR you get, if the DDR is industrial rated and can, can do as wide a temperature range, uh, depending on the passive components, depending on the, the various die. And so really the system and package becomes the subset of, or the, the minimum of what are all the components that make up the system and package device. And so uh, it, it really depends on which components are integrated. And so that's, so you'll, you'll be able to see a lot of different temperature ranges. Now, uh, along with temperature comes thermal. Um, and it's, it's interesting because uh, system and package devices kind of become a thermal averager because everything's uh, put together on a single substrate and they have a piece of molded plastic, which is basically a heat spreader. 
And so you end up getting a little bit of thermal averaging. So you won't see the, some, some of the dyes that would be hot, um, they aren't quite as hot. The dyes that are cool are not quite as cool. And so, so it, gets, it kind of acts as a big thermal averager. Uh, so you still will see hot spots over your processor and your PMIC and, and things like that. But you're not going to, it's not going to be quite as high or quite as low as you would have otherwise seen uh, in discrete devices. All right, any other questions? Oh. Long-term availability. Ah, long-term availability. Uh, well, the, that's, that it really depends on the company. So, I mean, I, I can only speak for, for our company, but um, we, we pretend, uh, we are committed to offering them for as long as uh, Texas Instruments offers the AM3358. And we could actually potentially offer them longer because uh, you can actually do lifetime buys. So depending on when, when uh, silicon vendors end of life things, system and package companies can actually do end of life buys. And so they could actually offer products longer than particular silicon vendors because they're able to do some of these inventory management things. So. And, 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 um... Speaking for, for TI, um, the AM335 has been around for a good long time and it's going to be around for a good long time because it's a really, really, really popular device. Um, so this particular one, I don't think you have to worry about it in any way, shape, form, or fashion. It's going to be available for a good long time. Uh, and, and with anyone, you know, you want it to have a, a broad market, right? So it's nice or um, it's, it's the, the broader the market, the, the better the longevity. And because this is an industrial targeted part, it gets in, designed into it a lot of um, industrial automation equipment and stuff, so they have very long um, life cycles. Um, you know, so so it'll be still available in small quantities for a very long time. Yes. So are you guys planning the next generation Pocket Beagle with uh, wireless connectivity? Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, let Jason. The, the the question is is are we planning um, next generation Pocket Beagle with wireless connectivity? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, for, for Pocket Beagle, we're not um, at this phase looking to, to integrate wireless on it. It's, it's pretty easy to add it um, externally. If, the, if there was a SIP available that had wireless technology, I think we'd be very excited about using it, um, but we don't necessarily want to, to deal with that complexity all on, our, on our own. Um, uh, does that answer that enough? I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, with that, uh, we will. Uh, both Jason and I have posters at uh, at our uh, the technical showcase. Uh, we have some demos, uh, some cars, uh, remote controlled cars, and some uh, old school gaming uh, for Whack a Mole, as well as you can come see kind of some of the the guts of of what system and package devices look like. So uh, I definitely encourage you to come come check, uh, talk with us, and uh, we we will definitely uh, be be around if you have any other questions. So with that, thank you very much.